Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Sachs, and on behalf of Campbell and Company, I'd like to welcome you to How to Successfully Onboard Nonprofit Team Members. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to quickly go through some logistics for those of you who may be new to our webinars. Close any program other than GoToWebinar that are running on your computer. We recommend calling in with a phone instead of using your computer speakers. If you experience visual issues, send a chat to Campbell and Company or contact GoToWebinar at the number on your screen. Today's webinar will last 60 minutes and you'll earn one continuing education credit that is good with your participation with CFRE International. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive an email from GoToWebinar that includes information on how to download your certificate. And in that same follow-up email, you'll also receive a link to download today's slides along with a link to the recording. We welcome questions throughout the webinar, so please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel that should be on the right side of your computer screen. We'll hold time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters today. Marianne DeBerry, Daphne Logan, and Chris McFeely. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm Marianne DeBerry, and I am Senior Counsel in Executive Search for Campbell & Company. I've been with Campbell & Company since 2006 and in Executive Search for since 1996. And I'd like to introduce our guest today, who's Daphne Logan, Senior Vice President of People & Culture for Start Early. Thank you, Marion. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm excited to get going on this webinar. Um, I'll just add a little bit more to what Marion said. I've been with Start Early for three years. Uh, when I started, we were the ounce of prevention fund. So we've had a lot of change happen in the past three years, including the most famous year of all, 2020, that extends into this year. <laughs> And I am Chris McFeely, happy to be here with Daphne and Marion today. I'm the director of the executive search practice here at Campbell & Company, and um, I've been with Campbell & Company for just over 20 years now. And with that, we will launch right into our agenda so that we can get going with a lot of exciting information today on onboarding. Um, the first thing we want to touch on a little bit is the difference between uh, orientation and onboarding. And then we'll talk about planning for onboarding and successful outcomes, as well as maybe some pitfall stories that we can add in there and what to avoid. Then throughout the webinar, but also in, in one particular area, we want to address um, COVID issues that we've run into with onboarding new employees, and then talk a little bit about what to do if we um, find that someone isn't integrating well into the organization. So with that, I will turn it over to Marion and Molly for a quick poll. Thanks, Chris. Um, so in a moment, I will launch the poll. Um, the question is, do you have an onboarding plan for new team members that includes procedures for remote onboarding? So you should see a poll on your screen. Um, I'm going to leave it open for a little bit, letting everyone have a chance to answer that. Great, I'll just leave it open for a few more seconds. So anyone who hasn't responded yet, please um, just log your answer there. Great, I'm gonna close it now share the results. So it looks like 40% of you said yes, you do have an onboarding plan that includes procedures for remote onboarding, while 60% of you said no. So fairly, um, fairly divided there. This is, this is fantastic, though, because there are, many of you are thinking about onboarding and really have some plans for being able to bring people into the organization. And for those of you who said that you don't, no worries. Um, hopefully there are things that'll, that will come out of this that will direct you to how you want to think about it. Um, and you can learn from each other. So with that, we're going to Chris and we're going to start with a bit of content for you. Thanks, Marion. And like I said, we'll talk a little bit about um, orientation as a piece of onboarding. 
a lot of times, and maybe even a long while ago, people thought of onboarding and orientation in very similar ways, and they're very different. Orientation is a part, um, a very important part of onboarding, and so we just wanted to touch on it quickly. And really, the way we think about orientation is a part of the day or over a period of a couple of days with COVID so that you can break things up for folks. It's really where you orient new employees to your organization. You review benefits, you set up meetings with team members and managers, you learn security protocols if you're going into an office, how to handle a lot of different procedures and policies, technology needs, all of those different types of um, sort of the things that everyone in an organization needs to know how to do that are not necessarily specific to your role. Um, but you are also very much um, oriented to the mission of the organization and the values. And so while it's a lot of time going over rules and policies, we think about orientation and trying to make it a little bit fun, um, especially with COVID and people are remote. You know, you really want to try to spice it up a little bit, maybe play some icebreaker um, activities, whether it's trivia about the employee handbook or a scavenger hunt uh, virtually, you may be able to set something like that up, but to make it engaging and entertaining a little bit for folks, because it really is important information that people need to know. So that's a little bit on orientation and to talk about onboarding, I'll turn it over to Daphne. Thanks, Chris. Um, you'll see on the screen a number of bullets about onboarding. Don't worry, I'm not going to read each of these to you. I'm just going to talk about it. I think the number one bullet is very critical and uh, will make your onboarding a success if you really do focus on learning and not producing. When anyone comes into the organization, no matter what level, sort of think about it as a listening tour. This is the opportunity for that person to meet key employees, obviously to meet their team if they are a supervisor, but if not, just their peers, boss, et cetera, and to meet people outside of their team. Because I think you get a lot more information and a sort of a, um, a nice landscape of the organization if you get to hear it from different perspectives. And as you know, all organizations struggle with siloing of departments. The onboarding piece is a great way to diminish those before they even start. So it's a way to get a leg up because you, you always hear it, no matter what you're doing, you know, try to avert it. So the onboarding piece, while it's a listening tour, before you even get to that, you want to involve others outside of the HR department and the person's direct supervisor. Really ask, what do you want to see from this new person, whether it's a leader or just that role? as it works, you know, integrated without, with others in the organization. And I mean, really talk to, you know, who will they collaborate with? Other peers, maybe some, you know, board members, depending on the, you know, the level of the position and maybe some external partners, you know, so really collaborate, collaborate with others in the organization for onboarding. After you do that, you'll have like probably this bevy of, people that you want the person to meet, to meet, information that you want them to read, whether it's the strategic plan, it might be the current work plan for the division, and I could go on and on, but I won't. So as you gather all of the important data that you want the new hire to you know, read and digest, please know it takes time. You don't wanna inundate the person after they first get into the organization. Remember when you were a new hire? I always try to tell my team that. Remember your first day on the job? I remember when I came to what was the Ounce of Prevention Fund three years ago, I was coming from an organization where I had been there 20 years. So you can imagine, I didn't really remember how to be a new hire. So I had to put myself in those shoes because I was one. And then to think about what would be best, you know, for someone new coming into the organization. Another step that we've instituted at Start Early, I do focus groups with new hires every six months. We have put in place 30, 60, and 90 day surveys that we ask new hires to complete. Very short surveys so we can get ongoing data because onboarding is continuously improving. And you really wanna to talk to the people that do come in, you know, after six months, after a year, 
what worked for you and what didn't. You also wanna to talk to their hiring supervisor or some of their peers to get their input. Again, it's all about collaboration. HR is the driver for onboarding, but we need to include key people within the organization to make it a success. You know, Daphne, if I can add to that, I hope people are seeing that onboarding is two-way, much more so than orientation is. Orientation is, in many ways, forms coming at you or little tiny videos, but, but effective onboarding involves the new hire as much as it does everyone else. Absolutely. Thanks for adding that, Marion. You know, we're learning from them as they are learning from us. And that's the reason we hired them. So we can't forget why we actually hired this person, not only to come in for that role, but to bring their experience and expertise to our organization. Because, you know, we think we know a lot, but we don't know everything. And sometimes we tend to look inside ourselves and we need to open our eyes and be you know, open to new ways of doing it. But there are always other ways of doing it. That's why I love these focus groups because I hear from what they did at their previous organizations or ways that we can improve the onboarding process. And there are many touchstones and touch points along the way. As we look at, you know, the increase in remote hiring, I guess one thing that I will say um, at the organizations that I've been with, we've always had remote hires. So going into this fully 100% on Zoom or whatever platform you use has been different um, for all of us. And I think what we relied on at Start Early is making sure that everybody has reached out to this new hire you know, in advance, not just the remote worker, but everybody. Um, we, what we do is we get like a fun fact from every new hire um, and their picture, we send it out to the whole staff in advance of them coming. So that is a welcome for them to come in and they feel good coming into the organization just to set them up for orientation. But as they go along and they're remote, you know, we make sure that the people and culture team have additional touch points with the new hire to make sure to see how their experience is. It's all about the employee experience and the employee life cycle. So that's what we've done, added additional touch points. I think we've also become more rigorous with our supervisors and the team that the new person is coming into up front, really being focused on, okay, what do you really want them to do or learn in the first 30, 60, and 90 days leading up to their initial peer review or whatever you call it at your organizations and making sure that we give them enough time to digest and giving it to them in different platforms. Sometimes it's a one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes they're um, listening to, you know, the training might be on demand so they can do it at their own pace. Again, I keep coming back to let's not inundate anyone, but certainly while we're remote, we're all getting Zoom fatigue, we're tired, you know, we're looking for the end of this and we're not out of it yet. And I think the sense of empathy um, is key and the sense of well-being for everyone that's in the organization. That doesn't start after they've been there six months or a year. It starts on day, actually it starts when you interview people. You know, as a nonprofit, if the person doesn't get the job, doesn't mean that they won't be an advocate or a potential fun funder or a donor at some point. So I think that's who we are. The culture has to speak for itself and listening is key. I think you know, that's a great point. Yeah. Sorry, Marion. No, 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 no. Chris, were you saying something? Yes. <laughs> but I can't see the videos so, so on my screen. And so is it okay if I go ahead? Yeah. I was just going to add that um, to Daphne's point. We always think about, you know, retention starts with the initial recruitment. Um, and we really need to even back onboarding up to the hiring process and how you put together your job descriptions, your interview process, and your questions, um, because it all ties together to, to make the employee experience really positive. 
You were kind of reading my mind there because I was about to start talking about what we think the outcomes are when you do onboarding. And as you'll see, so we can go to the next slide if you're, if you're comfortable. And when we talk about confidence, that is, that's another one that's a two-way, that's a two-way street. It gives, it gives the hiring manager a chance to see that, yes, uh, this really was a great decision for us. And it gives a chance for the employee to see, yes, this is a great decision for me. And one of the things that I think happens is when you start to think about what my job is, there, there's sometimes a disconnect between what people have seen in a job description or a position guide, because we, we use those to communicate the opportunity, but we also, as those of you who've had experience with this, we're listing everything about this job that could be possible. Whereas we know that when we hire the person, they are meeting most of those things, many of those things, but not all. So we have to get clear about of the things that they have and the things that we need. We make sure that we connect there because often when things don't work well, it's because people weren't clear. People weren't clear about what was expected of them. The hiring manager may not have been as clear as they could have been about what they wanted to see happen. And onboarding reinforces how this is supposed to, to go. We can talk about social integration and cultural alignment, which feels like it's the same, but maybe not. Social integration may be the overall organization, cultural alignment may be the division, or it could be in reverse. But it's important that it's important that it's alignment, and we use the term alignment rather than fit, because there is a sameness about fit that can be dangerous to organizations. So out of all that should come a higher productivity and a chance to measure it. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and Daphne and, and Chris may have things that they'd like to add to that. Chris, I know you can't see me, so I'm just going to jump in and then I'll stop talking and then you can jump in. I'll actually say, Chris, I'm done. Um, the only thing I'd like to add, Marion, is to highlight the piece about getting the data. You know, so getting the data from the staff and the new staff and others will help inform how we change and improve our outboarding outcomes. And again, it goes all the way back to the first day that you get the applicant or the application in, right? And you start scheduling the interviews. If you do the phone screening, how does that new hire feel about the person who's asking them questions? Do they get their answers? You know, do they get the answers that they need? Do they feel like, you know, the person was really engaged? So all of that feeds into successful onboarding outcomes, which you've talked about. And I think you're absolutely spot on about cultural alignment as opposed to fit. Um, you know, and that's evolved over the years uh, without aging myself. But um, the alignment is key, you know, especially if you didn't have a strong culture before the pandemic, you won't have one afterwards necessarily. Um, but I do think the pandemic, if handled, you know, as best that we could, knowing that we've never lived through this before, we're all vulnerable. And just as leaders and as hiring managers acknowledging that, outboard, outboard, onboarding outcomes have been pretty good. That's what we've seen. Chris, I'm done. Yeah, thanks, Daphne. And I would just add that, you know, when we talk about being fully present and engaged with new employees, I think it's also an opportunity for folks to think about, and we'll talk about assigning a mentor in a minute, but who, who sort of emerges as an unofficial mentor during your onboarding process? So if you're looking at it from, from the new employee standpoint, you, you know, the people that you engage with really well and sort of click with, you want to keep in touch with those folks going forward so that you can really lean on them when you need to for questions down the line. And I think um, it's one of those things that emerges out of having a strong plan for your onboarding, which we're going to talk about next. <laughs> and forward. Chris, can we have the next one? Uh oh, thank you. I feel like we have to read this one to you um, 
because it really is it really is true and it's really critical. When an organization has great onboarding, 69% of employees are expected to stay at least three years. This is a really critical point. We all can talk about turnover and we've all experienced it. And even though this is a very general discussion, for those of you who are hiring and are responsible for um, development professionals, we know what the tenures are. And anything that can help strengthen those tenures helps the organization because while this is not a discussion about um, rehiring, we all know the cost of that. So if you're able to have a strong onboarding, you can, as we've already talked about, be able to ensure a strong cultural fit. You begin to build loyalty to the organization. Um, and you also, in, by clarifying the expectations, you, you have people that know, that know and understand their jobs and they're willing to build upon what's expected of them. So I'll, I'll stop there because I, I know my colleagues have comments, particularly about you know, staying for three years in the tenures. This is Daphne, Chris, I'm gonna jump in and then I'll hand it to you if you wanna add anything. Um, here's my pitch for everyone to do some type of pulse survey or engagement survey, whatever you call it, because this is one of the key questions which determines the engagement at your organization. And we all know that if you have higher engagement, it leads to higher productivity. And we all wanna be higher, you know, high performing organizations. So just trying to, you know, how do you get the data? This is something that we can all at an organization get around. And actually you can see, well, who does it well and who may not, if you can divide up and cut the data by division or department. Um, this is a great way to, you know, make sure, again, the employee experience, engagement, productivity, you execute against your organization's strategic plan. Chris, all yours. I would agree. I think we can do an entire webinar on employee engagement and pulse surveys and how often to do them and what types of questions to ask. I think it's a fascinating area for us to explore in the future um, because I think in addition to onboarding, you know, you really have to plan for that. And, and it, is, it is so important in order to better the experience um, all the time. Um, so now that we're talking about onboarding plans, um, the first phase is really what we call pre-boarding. It's after the offer has been accepted, but before the, before the employees actually start. And so there's a lot of planning that needs to be done in order for um, your onboarding to work well, um, to be nice and smooth, and to really give the employees everything they need. And so in that pre-boarding time, whether it's two weeks before someone starts, or sometimes you have as much as a month if it's a more senior um, team member or a cohort of team members, you'll get through you know, the orientation, the paperwork. You can get a lot of those activities out of the way without inundating your new employee before they're actually um, on site. But they start to learn your culture during this time. And so those interactions here and there that you may have before the, before the person's first day are really important in building the rapport um, and giving them a sense of what it's like to work at the organization. Um, we, we definitely recommend assigning a mentor or a buddy at, at this time and encouraging them to reach out just to say hello. Um, and when you set up a buddy system like this, one thing we do at Campbell and Companies, we actually have written guidelines on what the role is of the mentor and the mentee so that we know what to expect from one another and we can hold one another accountable. Um, it's really easy to have a lot of meetings um, all the time and think, oh, well, we can meet next week. But we want to hold ourselves accountable to really being available to new employees if you are serving as a mentor and really helping them understand um, the different cultural pieces of the organization so that they can thrive in their role. Um, and I really, I think being a mentor is such a compliment for folks. I think it's just a really great um, opportunity if you, if you are able to do so. I always encourage folks to take that on with new employees. Um, and of course, the hiring manager and the supervisor arrange the onboarding schedule. Um, we suggest at least the first week or two to have a pretty a clear schedule for the folks so there's not you don't want to pack it too full but you also want to make sure that they have some structured time and like Daphne said different types 
of interaction, sometimes by phone, some of it Zoom, some time for reading. You know, we send people a lot of samples and information. Um, they need time to read that. And it's okay for them to do that, you know, in those sort of slower times in the first couple of weeks as they're getting to know what, what, what um, expectations are for their role. Mary and Daphne, anything to add to that? I just remember when I came to Campbell and Company that everyone had my personal email address and the number of people that just sent me, hello, welcome to Campbell and Company, can't wait to meet you. I, I felt like I was already there and it was really important. It was a small thing and I don't think anybody was necessarily prompted to do it, but it was a small thing, but it made a huge difference. I felt, I felt like I had a responsibility to this company now. I'll just add one thing. Um, the mentor or buddy assignment is so important. I think even more so in the remote environment. You know, you can't, you know, we, when we were in the office, we would allow a certain budget so the buddy could take out the new hire for lunch. Okay, well, we can't do that now. But we also have virtual yoga or virtual, you know, um, like working out because clearly, you see, I think you can see my exercise bike in the back not that i've used it but those are other ways that the buddy can connect it doesn't have to always just be about the work at hand um but i would love if somebody in the chat could give us a new name for the buddy system i'm so tired <laughs> i'd love to rename it so i ask you please send in your ideas you know we could call love it bitch and fun dance but that didn't work out so well <laughs> So um, planning a giant welcome, and these are just a few ideas, but let, let yourself go wild on this. And frankly, some of this may sound a little bit, um, I don't know, hokey, but it, you, you'd be surprised at how, how I'm, I'm back at planning a giant welcome. Oh, there we are, sorry. So get the tag done. So that when people get there, they have a computer, they have their mind, they have the things that, that will let them be able to work. And if you have things like interesting swag, send it, send it at the time um, and anything so that they will know. Now, here's one of my favorites, the list of office supplies and use Amazon Smile. All of you, I'm assuming that you're, you're familiar with Amazon Smile, but if you do that, what's bought is sent, part of it is sent to a person's favorite charity. It so cements our commitment in the nonprofit sector. It's a small thing, but it, it shows commitment. And I just think it's a really brilliant idea. And to have people be able to take advantage of that early, I think is an important one. Of course, we can talk about the tours of the office. So you'll have somebody walking around with an iPad, for instance, showing you how the office works. <laughs> and we, we've seen that done. But there are some other things that I think are interesting. I saw this once and I thought, I had to laugh, but it was really effective. There were enough people in the office that they had a quote red carpet, and the person came in and they were welcomed as if they were as if the paparazzi were on either side, and they walked through, and people were like cheering and making sure that they said hello and welcome, and oh my God, this is so wonderful! And can I have your autograph? And I mean, it may be over what depending on the size of your organization, it may not be quite as appropriate, but I thought it was so interesting to do that. And people, you can see people smiling. They were a little embarrassed, but they were smiling. And then this signage, you can put, you know, welcome Chris, you know, welcome Daphne. And I think people really do respond to that and they think that it's important. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and this again is a small one, but once we're out of remote and we're back in the office, if somebody is new, I think it's important that whoever greets them at the door, because it might not be their manager, says to them, Good morning and welcome, Daphne. Rather than hello, may I help you? Um, and you, you're you're now part of the organization, and a person is treating you as if you're a guest. And I, again, a small thing, but a way to really cement the relationship. So, um, and for remote, maybe you send videos, little videos, little emails that just say hello, how are you? Let me know if I can help you with anything. And I think that that those are the those are examples of things that, that have been that have worked well and that go a long way. I'll I'll stop there. This is Daphne. I'll just add a couple of points. I think the red carpet idea is so cool 
especially during this award season with SAG awards and the Oscars are coming up. Um, and I'm guessing there's a way to do that remotely through cool video snippet. There's probably an app out there or some program. So I'm going to ask my team when we meet, how can we do this? And I, I'm sure there are other things like kudos boards that you can uh, have everybody sign and send out either pre-orientation day or on the day of orientation. Um, I think that's one thing that has sort of popped up because everybody is remote. All of these other ways to engage, you know, employees that I, I had never heard of a kudos board before. Maybe it existed or maybe it didn't. But because we are remote, um, it's just a nice way to get everybody to sign on. And I think it also sort of, you know, if somebody wasn't going to sign something and they see everybody else has, it makes them sign it. And it's an easy way to get it around instead of walking a card by a cubicle or offices. So I think it's great. Chris, sorry, I'm done. <laughs> no, you're. I love all these ideas. I think it's really fun. And I think there's ways, you know, even beyond the welcome to keep some of this energy going. And not just for the new employee, but for all the employees because it's fun and and not everything has to be you know so work focused there can be some time for that social integration that Marion was talking about before that that let you you know get to know someone this outside of the workplace when you're you're not even in the workplace right now so I think these are all great ideas I just want to add one more comment sorry and I know this is me next nope. anyway, so I'll take it. But, you know, the other thing is it doesn't always have to be arranged by HR or the supervisor. Mm -hmm. So many other staff, if you're, you know, we use MS Teams like so heavily, I would never have imagined it before the pandemic. But people are sharing, you know, um, I don't know, my baby did this. How can I do that? And I mean, it's just grown the community. And um I think it's a benefit and it really has flourished in the past year and however odd months we're into this. Um, and it's something that we want to continue. So again, I mean, we have so many at all of our organizations, smart, talented folks. We know more about them than we ever have. And that includes just not only what they do at work, but their backgrounds, their kids come into the video, their pets, and it spurs on additional conversation. So the culture is still there. And I think we're able to even improve it if it wasn't where it want, where we want it to be, uh, you know, those types of things. So I'll just say it's not only dependent on HR to sort of uh, make play dates for folks, because that also can feel a little bit overwhelming. You know, we're adults and we can choose to do what we want to do, but to engage everybody because it just makes a, you know, it'll be easier when that person needs to reach out to somebody from a different team to work on a project because they have a little bit in common or they've already, I don't know, done yoga together. So I think I'm up next. Preparing an onboarding plan. So based on the poll that everybody took earlier, I think most folks, 60% of you do not have a formal onboarding plan for remote. I think that was the question. Marion, you can shake your head if I got that right. Yeah, you do. Um, yeah, and I think I spoke a little bit about that before. At start early, we've always had remote staff um, across the nation. So we built on what we wanted to do and incorporate, incorporated that into our formal onboarding plan. I think all of the pieces that you've heard us speak about, you know, to this point is part of the onboarding plan. You know, you want to collaborate with others, you know, not just the supervisor or the team but other key people or departments, both internal, external, and external. You want to gather the right documents or you know, materials for that person to learn even more about the organization and specifically about maybe what the work plan is currently for their own team and how they're gonna perform. You want to address any professional development that you require all new hires to take. So you're, again, going to have all of these chunks of uh, information and uh, communications to a new person. And you're going to set up these one-on-ones with key folks so they can either have a virtual coffee or, you know, we'll send them a Grubhub, you know, gift, gift card so they can do lunch together. 
and you can go off video for that while you chew. But other than that, you know, these are all the things that you want to incorporate, but still making it fun for the person to learn more and more. Um, something that we do also that is part of our onboarding plan, we call them start early talks. So you guessed it, it's based on TED Talks. Let's face it, I think our attention spans are even shorter now, but research has said that 20 minutes for an adult is basically how much we can take in at a time. So we've gone around the organization for various divisions and they've done a 20 minute start early talk. There's guidelines that we set because we want every area to touch on the same things, but then they use their own creativity, how they want to bring in other staff members, or you know what they want to talk about, and it's all relevant. But those are on demand because we can't do those in person, and it's easy for folks to get to. Um, and at various points in the onboarding plan, I think I mentioned this earlier. You know, I do a focus group. You know, with the, the, with all new staff, they complete surveys along the way up to 90 days, and we continue to talk to folks to find out. How's it going? What can we adjust? What do we need to do? Are you getting everything that you need? That not only comes from their supervisor and other teammates, but from the PNC team. Uh, we have a small team and we ask that, you know, I ask that all the team members reach out to folks so they know they can come to any of us. I might not be able to answer a real detailed benefit question, but I can get them to the right answer or get them to the right person. So I talked a lot about that, but I think. You know, everything that we've said, and it really does begin with pre-boarding, is part of onboarding. And it really doesn't technically end, but it's six months to a year, if you want to call it, you know, put a timeline on it. Daphne, I have a question, and that's, how did you move your organizations from orientation to onboarding, and how did you get buy-in? So the first thing is really uh, language and defining the difference because so many folks will use it interchangeably. Oh, well, orientation is onboarding. Or orient onboarding is that first day when they come and learn about benefits. So we had to clearly distinguish between the two. And then I think, you know, showing folks broadly, all hiring managers at the beginning, when we first post a job, what onboarding looks like from an HR perspective, and really just an organizational perspective, and the benefits is how we got buying it. And I would say at both organizations, you know, we got so much rich information from the people that we talk to. Because again, we need to do list, we need to listen as well, because we don't know the best. What is somebody really supposed to learn from? Um, I don't know our one of our programs division, you know, and what they're working. I'll just say home visiting. Yeah, I'm not the expert there. Let me go talk and find out how we incorporate onboarding into that if the person doesn't work in that area. Um, and I think, you know, it takes time just like anything else. But if you ask and you listen and show the benefits and they're getting a person that's much well-rounded. And, you know, our goal is start early. We want to have a lot of internal mobility, right? So the more that we can provide access to all of the organization, the better the person is, the richer that their professional experience can be, and the better for start early. Uh-oh. <laughs> we can keep talking. Yeah. That's dang no, it's, it's I think fun. it's open discussion. It is, it is among the three of us about things that may have worked, may have not worked. I don't know, one of the things I wanted to add was just, I think that, and, and you alluded to it, Daphne, is to say that onboarding really is an aspirational event right? because it, it is continuous. It doesn't stop. Um, and if you do it right, you'll always be doing some iteration of it that will change over time, which is decidedly different from orientation and you need to say that again orientation has a you know you get forms you fill out forms you sign forms you go to your and but that's not what onboarding is at all uh, and you I know just, one thing I, oh sorry no I, I was finished the only the other thing i'll add you asked how did i 
you know, sort of get the organizations to see the difference between the two. You also have to educate new hires because as we all know, as you know, HR professionals are in the business, you know, a lot of organizations don't do onboarding, not true onboarding because they call it orientation. So you also have to bring in the new, you know, you know your new hire and explain what you're trying to do and why you're giving them this information and what and how it can help them. And are they missing some pieces? You know, it, it, it has to be, you, you know, you have a plan set in place, but you have to be flexible enough to customize it to the person. We're all unique individuals. And I think especially in the time of COVID, um, we're learning that even more and more and more. And, and you have to be flexible and adaptable with your onboarding plan. I served on a board a few years ago and we hired an executive director and we set out an onboarding plan for her and she decided she didn't like it and didn't want to follow it. And yes, she had problems. <laughs> she just said, you know, I'll do this myself. And she didn't do many of the things that we had asked in terms of the onboarding. And it, yeah, there were bumps along the way that we probably could have avoided had we just been a little bit more rigorous about insisting that she do them. I think one one thing you're touching on there, Marion, is um, how we tailor the plan for different positions. Because every individual is different, but also every role is so different, I think there, there are pieces that need to be the foundation of an onboarding plan so that, that all employees receive the same types of training and cross training. But I also think when we're thinking about creating a plan for an executive director is different than a manager or coordinator level um, and thinking about creatively what, what are the best pieces of the plan that, that each team member um, so that it's very robust for everyone as they're coming into the organization. Mm -hmm. Definitely different by level. Very different, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But it still builds on the same sort of framework. You know, as you said, Chris, what is the foundation? Who do they need to meet with? What are the materials? It's, it's longer, potentially, depending on, you, you know, your level. And you may involve more external partners or donors, potentially, depending, again, you know, if you're hiring for the CEO or the uh, executive director. Um, yeah, but I, I think you run into trouble or you see the signs of trouble if the new hire doesn't want to do the onboarding. Because <laughs> how will they know the organization and be able to do their best? And so, you know, we all have a degree of discomfort when we go into a new organization and the onboarding is really to be that light, that guiding light to help you be successful. That's what it's there for. We only want our new hires and staff to be successful or else we wouldn't even have onboarding or orientation. We'd be like, here, go there, you know, and, and how can we make the experience better, you know, when we're all remote. Which I think brings us to measuring effectiveness, Chris. <laughs> sure. I, a lot of this we've touched on throughout, so I, and I know I want to be mindful of our time to have a lot of time for questions that are coming through. But um, I think it's very important, as you know, Daphne and Marion have both said, is to make sure that we're getting the pulse along along the way. You know, having check-in meetings with the manager, getting feedback from the new employees. Um, as they're going through the process so that you can adjust direction um, in real time and not wait for the next series of employees to come in. There can always be adjustments need to be really flexible. And so, you know, measuring how long it takes folks to, to become productive members of the organization um, and, and your turnover rate can really help um, identify what pieces of onboarding you may need to uh, improve on. I think we covered this pretty well. I think we can move on really to talking more about COVID. Marion, are you going? You jump in first. I do. I've, 
You know, we've all lived through enough COVID now that we like to think that we <laughs> we probably can have reinvented how this is all supposed to go. But the other side of thinking about COVID is that we're not always going to be in this space. And so part of the onboarding that we have to think about going forward is how do we think about having a plan that is flexible enough for us to um, bring people into the organization well as we ease out of this, as we ease out of this period of our life. Um, and so I, I think it, it's even more important that we capture the things that we've talked about because a lot of this we really have, we have clarified, but there are a couple of things to be mindful of. Some, better, some people are better at remote work than others, and we have to be a little more respectful of the personal, meaning you, part of the onboarding is, are you able to recognize that perhaps the new hire is not a person who does well remotely, so you may need to check in more often. And it's not, checking in because you're micromanaging you just are being sensitive to what that person may need around their onboarding and there are little signs that will tell you when you talk to them they talk perhaps longer than you had scheduled because they just need somebody to talk to and those are the kinds of things that we think of um i think so i read something interesting that lately that said when you start a new meeting with with everyone Spend five minutes or so more than you might have talking about things that just are related to their lives. Again, that's another way to make sure that people are included in the work of the organization, particularly if they were hired remotely and they haven't met their, their colleagues. They've only seen them on Zoom. So they don't have the same kind of connection. Um, and so there's a, you know, the little inside jokes that happen among team members, they don't know because they, they, they're not around to pick them up. Um, but at the same time, you have to hold the the expectations of, of what a person is able to do. I think Daphne makes a great point. Having you know animals walking by and kids waving hello, you know it it does it does help the the onboarding and and the work process because a person feels like they can bring their entire life into their work um, in a way that may be different right now, and hopefully that they can do that you know in the future. I'm feeling fortunate because I have two cats and at any moment, one of them might walk across the screen, but luckily they didn't do that today. <laughs> um, but that's all, you know, and that, that, so that's, that's my thinking about, about COVID and, and its effect on us. So I'll turn it to Daphne or Chris to add some things and then we'll get to the end. Um, it's Daphne. I just have a couple of comments, uh, you know, on the first bullet point as we all are sort of thinking about, you know, what is the office going to look like when we return? It's not going to look like it did. So we all know that. I think one thing to keep in mind, if you had telecommuting or remote work policies before the pandemic, please don't make them more punitive after the pandemic. You know, they should at least stay in place as they were um, and you know there's so many surveys and you know articles about different organizations and different um, industries and what they're doing i think it's fine to read about those but i think you know your organization which is unique and you have to plan accordingly and not just do what somebody else did you can always you know pick and choose but i think you have to be true to your own organization the other thing that, I mean, is quite apparent is that it's an employee market right now. So everyone has gotten a taste of what it feels like to work from home. I mean, some of it negative because, oh, you don't have any boundaries. You're working, you know, 12 hours a day. I mean, that's always been the research uh, behind working from home that you work more. So we have to help whoever remains remote get boundaries, you know, between that work and life. Um, it's not even work-life balance. It's just sort of work and life. I mean, boundaries are gone, right? Um, and then I think, you know, there are going to be certain times where everybody is going to want to come in at some point. I think it's always, I think it's going to be a hybrid model for a long time. And you have the extremes of or companies that are saying all remote, all 100% back in the office. We'll see. I don't know that we know what it's going to look like, but be true to your organization 
and listen to your staff because other companies know that, oh, you don't have to live in Chicago for you to be a great employee in LA because you can do this work remotely because you've been doing it for over a year. So that's all I have. I one Marion and I, when we were preparing for this, talked about something that um, we thought was really interesting in our research. And I think it, it applies to probably every single one of us and every organization. And it's sort of the thought of reboarding. And as we prepare these office, you know, return to the office, whatever that may look like, we might all need a little bit of a refresher <laughs> on how to come back together in different ways and work together. Um, that was focused on folks who take leaves of absences and how they may need some, some onboarding when they come back. But I think it will apply to all of us as we get ready to um, see what, what's in store for, for what our work looks like in the future. And people still may be afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. oh, we've got variants. Oh, which, you know, who's not back? It's ongoing. So um, I think the last thing we want to talk about and open it for questions again, we want to be mindful of time is what if this is not the alignment that we wanted? Um, and how do we how do we address it? And how early do we do that? And this, um, and we've, we've asked Daphne if she would start the discussion around this and we'll all pick up. Yeah, I, you know, I think if you have done a good job with the pre-boarding and the inter, you know, the interview, the orientation and onboarding, and you put in, you have some type of um, performance metric in place, you should have an inkling, if not more so by 90 days. But let's face it, we all have had hires that just don't work out. And you don't really know necessarily within 90 days. You know, the goal is to at least know, at least from my perspective. Um, and, you know, I think it's having frank conversations with the employee because typically the employee and the supervisor know. And if you're having regular one-on-one, -on -one, you know, one-on-ones or communication about what's doing, you know, how's it going, what's expected along the way, it's not going to be a surprise. I know that sounds, you know, everybody says it should never be a surprise, but typically in my experience, and it's been <laughs> decades, um, I've only come across one person that didn't think it wasn't right for them. You know, they thought, oh no, I can make this work. And I'm like, really? Let's really talk about it and dissect it. And you don't want to get it to the end where it's like, yeah, boom, done, it's over, unless, you know, something drastic happens. But, you know, it's going to happen. I will say that. Hopefully not, you know, more often than we see. I mean, it's just going to happen. So don't beat yourself over it. Just make sure that you put in the right, um, you know, I guess the right foundation for a successful onboarding and you won't have to do it as much. But it does happen. Uh, I've opened the floor. Mary and Chris. There's nothing that I would add. I agree. Well, thank you three for, for such a great presentation so far. Um, we're going to open it up for some audience questions and reflections. We do have several, so um, we'll see how many we can get to. Um, first, I wanted to share just a couple examples and reflections that um, our audience members shared. One person shared this reflection. We have various folks who run a social activity such as book club or yoga invite the new person instead of the trainer or HR just saying we have these things check the calendar and then one other reflection we wanted to share I'm onboarding three new hires next week I have it split over a week and a half, so they have downtime to digest everything and not be on screen for eight hours. <laughs> All right, and now let's head into some questions. 
Is onboarding for the new CEO the same as staff who report to the CEO? I'll just jump in really quickly and then I think Mary is chomping at the bit to say something. I would say no, it is not the same. Um, you know, they're going to have a lot more uh, interaction with their boss, the board of directors, so that they, the board, uh, plays a bigger role in their onboarding. But the answer, quick answer is no, not the same. Well, I was just going to say, I think when you when you laid out the timeline, Daphne, and you said you can be around six months with a CEO, it would not be unusual for it to be the year. Uh, because there are so many things to address. There are the people that report to them, and then there's the board. And depending on the size of the board and the kind of things that are imperative for the organization, it could easily be up to a year. So it, no, it's it, it's not the same. And, and I would add one. Be, and more, part of the question might be who actually shapes that onboarding plan. And depending on the size of the organization, I think it probably is a combination of board. And if there is a head of HR in, in concert to execute that. I would add one important factor that we found when we've been um, helping organizations onboard a new executive director or CEO is that the soon to be renamed buddy system is really important. And so <laughs> we always recommend someone on the board who's got experience mentoring and there's usually great board members part of their professional career who, who are great mentors, serve as that mentor and really help them along and help them navigate that first year. I think it's really important. No. Thank you. And okay, to on to our... We've actually seen examples where if it's a new CEO, meaning this is the first time they've actually been a CEO, that there has been some um, coaching that's also been part of onboarding. Sorry, Molly. No worries, Marianne. Um, our next question is, could you say more about the critical difference between cultural alignment and cultural fit? Uh, I see them as organization versus your team. Now others may see that differently, um, but I, I mean, you know, the team has to fit the organization, but you may be in a team that's quite technical, um, but overall the organization might not be quite as much. And I think you have to fit both. Um, but I think how you assign the term cultural alignment versus social integration, you know, is a little bit fluid. The social integration also could be uh, the person that remarked that, you know, there's a there's a team that's forming. And that's also part of the social integration is that you're able to feel like you're welcome to go um, play sports with the uh, with others that are there or that you're you can join the the book club uh, and that's that's part of the social integration it, it's just it, it's just things that enhance how you you're involved in the organization but i i'm sure chris and daphne have some thoughts about that too chris i'll jump in really quickly i agree with what you said uh, marion and i think the other piece from my perspective, what I've found is as we, you know, really make sure that we are DEIB uh, aware, you know, um, cultural fit doesn't necessarily sit well with different demographics or just the diverse staff or new people coming in and alignment seems to sit well better. And it's more of a like this, uh, it's a language thing, you know, and, and how people internalize oh, I'm supposed to fit. Well, I don't look like them. How am I going to fit into the culture? So that's why we've sort of taken on different words to describe what we're trying to get to. And cultural alignment seems to feel better, um, more inclusive, uh, a sense of belonging. So that's where I was coming from, too. And I'd be happy to, uh, you know, other thoughts on that. From Chris or I agree with that. I really agree with that. I think I, I look at it as, um, you know, we're, we're, we're putting the mission and our values wherever you work at, at the forefront. And everyone coming from different backgrounds can, 
can have the same values and really um, impact the mission, we just get there in different ways. And so when I think of alignment, I think of us sharing um, all sorts of ways to get to you know, our final destination, which is impacting the mission. All right, well, I think we can squeeze in one more question before we have to end. Um, can you share more details about expectations for mentors? I can jump in there because I brought up the guidelines. Um, we, we ask our mentors to make sure that they're checking in regularly with um, those that are assigned, if they're formally assigned as a, ment as a mentor, um, taking them for lunch, and then doing these things remotely since we are remote, but really being a sounding board when um, their mentee has questions or comes up uh, upon roadblocks or barriers. And, you know, we, we ask, I think it's monthly, at least monthly check-ins throughout the year. And, um, you know, sort of a mix of work focus and a little bit of social focus as well. And what we found is that a lot of times, once the year is up, those relationships still stay in place, even without the formal check-in. The only thing I'll add, I think our guidelines are similar, Chris, is that we want the person who's the buddy to be at the organization at least one year, you know, uh, so they sort of know the ropes by then and they're, they're through their onboarding, <clears throat> excuse me. And I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, we sort of, we train our buddies. So we give them not only the guidelines, but certain questions that may come up from a new hire and say, you know, we want the buddy to really tell them how it is, you know, be frank, be honest and you know just sort of be that person that they can go to and you know how you have that person at work hopefully it may turn into that person it may not but they're there and they're ready to great well that is all the time we have today thank you so much for joining us um, and a special thank you to Daphne for sharing her time and expertise today Look out for our email with the webinar recording and slides, and don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you have questions. We also encourage you to sign up for future Campbell & Company webinars. Next up is Fundraising Communications for Communications Materials for Major Gift Cultivation, and that will be on May 19th. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you.